Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good afternoon once again. We are in the second part of our lecture. After having presented a panoramic vision of the involvement of the Catholic Church in the ecumenical movement in recent times, now our uh, task is to do an appraisal of the involvement of the Catholic Church with suggestions and uh, recommendations on its involvement. So second part. And now the first thing that we are going to look at is uh, uh, the theological dialogues. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is true that the last 50 years and more of the ecumenical involvement saw the elimination from many hearts of forms of animosity and hatred. It is largely through their ecumenism, the dialogue of charity and the dialogue of, of, of theological nature. Now, when we look at the amount of work done by the various theological commissions in promoting theological uh, and doctrinal dialogue evidence in the large collection of dialogue tests, we are astonished. These tests witness to the patience, goodwill, and hope for unity of the members of the commissions. Uh, they many have sweated for long, long hours in study, reflection, and discussion, and finally writing these dialogue tests. Now the question is, have these tests been known, read, appropriated by the Catholics, especially the leaders? There is no evidence that these tests have been widely available to and read by churches and members of the ecclesial communities. Instead, they have remained mostly on the shelves of a few experts and have had hardly any serious bearing on the Christian communities. Yes, these dialogues should continue, they do have a role, though limited. However, we should not place much hope on their overall impact. In fact, however hard the theological commissions work, they cannot on their own produce the unity we seek and Christ wills for the church. A related question is, how long are the commission members to go on talking? And what happens when the talks lead nowhere? The answer is not easy. Let us take the case of the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, which started its work from 1966 and met for the first time in 1970 and from then on until today. Though now the present one is the third commission that is going on. Two commissions now have come and gone. The third is at work. Since its inception, it was only recently that the third commission issued its first agreed statement with the title, Walking Together the Way, Learning to Be the Church, Local, Regional, Universal. Now, in spite of the much optimism of the early years and anticipated hopes for an imminent reunion of the Anglicans and the Roman Catholics, the tensions between these two communities have only been growing. In the early 20th century, the tensions were over moral issues such as polygamy, remarriage of divorced persons. From the mid 20th century, it was over the ordination of women to presbyterate and the episcopate. And the late 20th century into the 21st century, most acute tensions have concerned questions of human sexuality, abortion, contraception, premarital sex, promotion of gender ideology, accepting homosexual unions. As you know, Anglican communions most of the, in most places in the world accept all those. With the decision to ordain women to the episcopate in 2006, Cardinal Caspar, the then president of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Unity, already warned of a new huge hurdle in the path. He said the quality of the dialogue would be altered by such a decision. Ecumenical dialogue in the true sense of the word has its goal the restoration of full church communion that has been the presupposition of our dialogue that is between Anglicans and Roman Catholics until now. That presupposition would realistically no longer exist following the introduction of the ordination of women to epistemic. You see the problem. See the problem. 
we have been moving further and further than closer and closer in spite of the dialogue. So the problem is more and more, oh, 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 let us say, giving in, giving up faith and giving in to all sorts of compromises. And here it is good to reread what John Paul II said in Uthunum Sinti number 18. Uh, in matters of faith, compromise is in contradiction with God who is truth. In the body of Christ, the way and the truth and the life, who could consider legitimate or reconciliation brought about at the expense of the truth? Or is in the same encyclical, he says, ecumenism is not a question of altering the deposit of faith, changing the meaning of the dogmas, or eliminating essential words from them, accommodating truth to the preferences of the particular age, or suppressing certain articles uh, of the creed under the false pretense that they are no longer understood to them. Good. Now we move to another problem uh, that we can take note of, the an exaltation of a false pluralism. The Second Vatican Council had praised a healthy pluralism, appreciated and encouraged a healthy pluralism in the Church. It spoke about diversity in spirituality, liturgical traditions, theological theologies, etc. Very legitimate. However, this also had its flip side. In the name of ecumenism, people gathered to celebrate their differences, which simply meant a collapse into doctrinal and moral relativism. While we might celebrate some God-given differences, we cannot or rather should not celebrate differences which arise from sin. Christian divisions are consequence of sin, not grace, of sin. They should not be celebrated but atoned for and remedied. Pluralism at the expense of essentials of unity can only lead to further fragmentation and not to a rich Catholic unity. Thus, some brands of Catholic ecumenism today have become simply heretical, in that they have retained the overall theme of togetherness, but given up what makes them specifically Catholic. As the adjunct professor of theology at Newman University, uh, Dusty Gates said, 21st century attempts at so much at so-called ecumenism are uh, more often social arrangements which perpetuate a sort of I am okay, you are okay mentality. This, he says, is a misunderstanding of ecumenism. When we settle for diversity and simple coexistence without a genuine concern for unity in faith and divine charity, we slowly widen the gap that separates us instead of building bridges. Diversity and simple coexistence can only last briefly. Sooner or later, either the issues that divide will come to the fore and fight will begin once again, or the groups will become isolated without any sense of belonging or genuine communication. Here it is good to reread what Unitatis Redentegratio says in number 11, where Pope says, Nothing is so far into the spirit of ecumenism as a false irenicism, which is noted in this exaltation of a false pluralism, in which the purity of Catholic doctrine suffers and its genuine and certain meaning is clouded. Another area of critic is regarding attempts of many to fabricate Christian unity. Unity of the churches cannot be fabricated. It has to be given. It has to be graced. Uh, in the post-Vatican II church, some being rather naively optimistic and lacking a clear understanding of the challenges and dangers of a ecumenical journey, and often impatient with a slow pace of progress set about fabricating Christian unity. Remember, it is a sort of Pelagian thinking, 
where church's unity, some imagine, is to be brought about by our own efforts rather than the grace of God and our active service in letting the deposit of faith be known and loved. The past 60 years of ecumenism must teach us one thing. We cannot fabricate unity of the churches or Christians. All such attempts, such as some churches amalgamating to form a united church or proposing a sort of unity without the sacramental and juridical components to start with, or promoting intercommunion, which many attempted, against the clear ancient practice and current guidelines and of the magisterium are, or engineering compromised political formulas where truths of faith are sacrificed are doomed to fail. Instead, we must rely now more than ever on the grace of God in our search for Christian unity. In our Christian, in our search for Christian unity, the reasons for our many divisions are certainly doctrinal, emotional, and sometimes simply political and pragmatic. That is a matter of convenience. In all these areas, the light of Holy Spirit is needed. It is the Spirit of God who can illumine minds and hearts to see the truthfulness of the whole deposit of faith transmitted in and through the Church. It is again the Holy Spirit who can heal the hearts of painful memories, prejudices, and fears. It is the same Holy Spirit who can give the courage to Christians to leave their comfort zones for the sake of Christ and His plan of salvation for the world. That is why both the Second Vatican Council and Pope John Paul II insisted that the change of heart and holiness of life along with the public and prayer for the unity of Christians, should be regarded as the soul of the whole ecumenical uh, movement. The unity of Christians cannot come easily. There is no reason to settle down for a unity that is less than authentic. Jesus prayed for unity, that his disciples be one at the Last Supper, and we must do the same. We must do our part, yes, especially by working out our salvation with fear and trembling, as Paul says in Philippians. But we must also be patient. There is the importance of patience as we allow the Holy Spirit to bring about the unity of the churches. It is the Holy Spirit who brings about the wonderful communion of the faithful. Ultimately, Christian unity is God's will and God's work and not our own solely. Unity requires many holy souls who will atone for the sins of disunity rather than celebrating disunity or fabricating a man-made unity. Let us ask for ourselves, how many Christians, apart from having a vague wish, really long for Christian unity? How many suffer with the, with the mystical body of the church for the sins of disunity and implore God's mercy? Isn't even the week of prayer for Christian unity mostly ignored, and where it is not, transformed into something social, cosmetic? I believe it is only prayer and penance, prayer and penance, on the part of great number of Christians for Christian unity that can ultimately bring down the grace of unity. We stop there, the second uh, transmission, and when uh, the third part, we shall look at uh, what pe certain people are saying about uh, the church's efforts of evangelization and discouraging people, discouraging those who invite others to come back to the Catholic communion. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.